from the Kingdom of Ohio, this is O'Culture with Ryan Peverly. Hey yo, from the heart of it all and a living room somewhere near the birthplace of aviation, this is O'Culture. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much for being here. My guests this time around, members of the Ohio Ghost Hunters, one of the largest paranormal patrols of its kind in the U.S. They're in the house. We're going to talk a little ghost hunting with the gang. But first, if you don't already know, we're living in the most interesting time in recorded human history. Try this one on for size. A paralyzed woman in the Netherlands has become the first person to communicate strictly through her thoughts. You heard that right. A paralyzed woman in the Netherlands has made history as the first person to be fitted with a new kind of brain implant that permits patients incapable of speaking or moving to finally communicate only through their thoughts. It's special to be the first, says the patient, who is referred to as only H.B., She's 58 years old and wishes to remain anonymous. HB was diagnosed with ALS in 2008. ALS, of course, short for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, a severe disease that damages nerve cells, which results in people losing control of their bodies. HB lost the ability to breathe within just two years of being diagnosed, resulting in her requiring a ventilator. Nick Ramsey, who was part of the team working with HB at the Brain Center of University Medical Center Utrecht in the Netherlands, describes her condition as completely locked in and said that when he met her, she was using an eye tracking device to communicate. Now, this eye tracking device gave HB the opportunity to choose letters on a screen to spell out words, but one in three people with ALS experience loss of eye movement, making that particular communication method a potential dead end. Teams have been working hard to generate a solution for this by trying to come up with devices that are controlled directly by the brain, and it appears they have succeeded. This new implant works by reading brain activity and translating it into a signal that's capable of controlling a computer or a robotic limb. The device allows HB to spell out words and sentences, works anywhere, and gives her the opportunity to communicate with people in the outside world without the need for a third party. The eye tracking device, for example, while effective for communication, did require daily recalibration from a team of medical engineers. The brain implant obviously does not. Ramsey said it's a world-first system that works at home without the need for any experts to make it work. He also said, quote, we thought, let's make it simple and affordable for a patient who really needs it. Now, no word on how expensive the device actually is, but here's how it works. It's surgically implanted into the patient's brain. Two electrodes are positioned over the motor cortex region of the brain, which is responsible for movement. One electrode is placed over the part of the brain that moves the right hand and the other is placed over the part of the brain that takes over when you want to count backwards. HB's electrodes are hooked up to a pacemaker-sized transmitter implanted into her chest. The transmitter is then capable of wirelessly communicating with a computer program on a screen in front of her. HB watches the screen, and as a square moves over letters, she imagines moving her right hand to click on a letter to spell out words and ultimately the thoughts she wants to convey. And the process to communicate may be slow, with it requiring a few minutes for her to spell out a single word, but she's getting faster with training. That's encouraging. Ramsey said he hopes to speed up the process for HB by incorporating more electrodes, and he has a goal of utilizing systems of 30 or even 60 electrodes to decode sign language or internal speech much more rapidly than the current system. So I have to say, that's a pretty neat story. Pretty cool. I'm not the biggest fan of technology, and I say that as I talk into a microphone hooked up to a tablet recording a digital radio show that will be listened to on smartphones. But when we use technology to improve quality of life for people, I'm a much bigger fan of it. When it works for the betterment of humanity, which let's be honest, it rarely does, I can get behind technology then. Of course, technology also plays a large role in ghost hunting, as my guests would and will tell you. And it also plays a large role in helping people who may not understand what sorts of paranormal phenomena they may be dealing with in their homes. Which leads me to my guests. Four team members from the Ohio Ghost Hunters are here. 
I think the group is around 20 members strong right now, one of the largest groups of its kind in the U.S. They investigate cases all around the state of Ohio where I get down. I think they've even ventured into some neighboring states like Indiana and Kentucky. Either way, I was able to hook up with four of them, including group founder and director Peggy McGuire. We talked a bit about what they do, how they do it, different types of hauntings, tips for people who may be experiencing a haunting, and some interesting paranormal anecdotes in general. As the title of the episode says, it's Ghost Hunting 101, and as one may expect, too, on a Skype call with a group of ghost hunters, did have some technical interference. Not too bad, though. And also, it's a return to my personal roots of the paranormal. I got really into ghost hunting 12 years ago when the Ghost Hunters TV show debuted. I'm not as much into ghost hunting now as I used to be, but I still do take it very seriously. And I have to, because I've had several paranormal experiences, and I've been around people who have had some paranormal experiences as well. Some rather intense ones. Speaking of intense, and speaking of returning to your roots, here's a remix of a track I was surely bumping back in my early ghost hunting days. My conversation with the Ohio Ghost Hunters is on the other side. Enjoy! Right, I'm here with the Ohio Ghost Hunters. Peggy, do we have everybody on the line? We do. Let me tell you who we have. We have four teammates. Myself, of course, this is Peggy. Um, I also have our case manager, Kent. We also Hello. have we also have Sarah. Hello. And we also have Jason. All right. How you doing? doing well. Hey, man. So we've got the four of us, and we got we'll, we'll keep it entertaining. I promise. It's great to have you guys here. I've I've followed your work. I've heard you guys talk on other uh, podcasts and uh, radio shows, and it's nice to actually get some time with you. I'm a big fan of what you guys do. So just going to get right into it. Peggy, I want to start with you, obviously, as the team director and the founder. Could you just tell me a little bit about when the group started and why? The group started a little over two years ago, and it was because both Nate and I, he's our co-director, we were a part of another team which decided to shut down. 
but we weren't ready to shut down. We wanted to continue this exploration. And so I started the group and Nate and I very quickly thereafter connected. So uh, we've been together ever since. How long ago was that? That was a couple of years ago. It was in 2014. Okay, so you guys are, are fairly new. I thought you were a little older than that for some reason. Where did the interest in starting a group come from then? Was it the proliferation of paranormal TV shows, personal interests, or what? I would say it's a combination of having already had personal experiences. Um, many of us on the team grew up in a paranormal situation, like a haunted house, or had an experience at work. Or, um, so... It, that and then the proliferation of the TV shows really just let us know it was okay to have this as an interest. And we maybe would still be thought of as somewhat normal or at least paranormal uh, in spite of the fact that we like ghosts and we believe in them. But one thing that Nate and I noticed a while back before starting Ohio Ghost Hunters is that there were too many teams out there we thought that would just investigate for the fun of it, but never help the people. So we would find a lot of clients would call us and say, you know, we had a team out here and they spent a few hours, but we never heard back from them. And we think you ought to hear back from the team when you have a team in your home and you're looking for help. So we really geared towards resolution as part of really our mission. Yeah, could one of you describe then what the mission of the group is? I think that's important. I guess our biggest mission is to uh, to help the public, to help people understand what, what is causing their situation in their homes. And then if they choose to rid themselves of it, we can also help in ridding the home of that. Okay, Kent, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question to that since you're the case manager. At what point should people reach out to folks like yourselves to schedule something? Because, you know, there might be people out there that think that they're experiencing something, but maybe it's not serious enough to call. Like, is there a certain point when they should call? Well, it depends on each case. Um, some people want to call just to find out what's in there. Some people reach out to us because they're afraid of what's there. And some people reach out because it's doing that harm or scaring their children to the point of the household is in a constant chaos and uproar. So anybody can reach out to us that feels they have a haunting. We'll investigate it, tell them to what degree they have, and then we'll tell them how to rid themselves of it if they want to. Okay. Sarah, you're on the call, right? Yes. Okay. So I was told that you're pretty well versed in the equipment side of it. So um, yeah, if, definitely. if I'm just getting started at home, like maybe I don't want to call you guys just yet. I want to test some things on my own. How can I go about that as just a, you know, kind of an amateur ghost hunter? What, what kind of stuff can I use that I might already have, or that might be cheap for me to just test my house for spirits? Well, everybody has a cell phone. Um, there's all kinds of recording programs that you can use on your cell phone. My favorite tool would be, probably be the recorder. Um, we get a lot of EVPs. Yeah, a, a cell phone would be good. A lot of people like to use the SB7. That's a, a voice box. It's a spirit box. And one of those can be made fairly cheap using a Radio Shack radio for $20. Um, all you do is take it apart and bend a prong, and then you got a SB7, basically. But I, I like the recorder best. You can use a simple flashlight, a dollar flashlight. Um, I don't know if you watch any of the shows, but you can ask questions with the flashlight. You just unscrew the back a little bit to where you can tap it and ha ask yes or no questions using that. If you want to get into like EMF detectors, there's a lot of them you can get for like $20. Um, you can build your own using a battery and LEDs and a little, a little um, sensor. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that people can use, but a cell phone, take pictures <clears throat> You know, use some of the voice programs on the cell phone, and that would probably be all I would do to get started. And a, a digital voice recorder, I mean, you can pick one of those up fairly cheap at Walmart or, you know, Amazon or whatever, and that's a good thing to, to start with. 
Okay. And that's a tool that we all use. Now, when you guys actually go out on a case, and I think I'm gonna, I'll toss it over to Jason here. Jason, do you describe yourself, first of all, as are you psychically sensitive? Um, yeah, I am considered to be a, a, a psychic empath. Um, when it comes into the empath side of it, it's really I don't necessarily see or hear them, but I can feel them. Um, you know, at some points I can get, you know, kind of giddy and, and childish, and that's really, okay, then there's possibly a, a child spirit in here. Uh, and that actually, I mean, will work in correspondence to the equipment. Um, I can simply, you know, say what I'm feeling, kind of what I'm experiencing, but we try not to actually lead people into it. So, you know, we would say, hey, I'm, I'm feeling something in this particular room. Um, you may want to make sure to do some EVP recording and maybe some photographs over here. And I mean, and that has progressed. It first started when I initially joined um, the actual group. Um, I'd never really experienced um, per se, an empath. Um, but honestly, the very first uh, investigation that I'd went on, I mean, there were three separate occasions to where I personally would just have broken down into tears, um, as well as gotten some chest pains, some heart pain, some shortness of breath, and it would come as quick as it came. So it wasn't a matter of, oh, I'm going to do this. It just, it just hit me like a brick wall. And then within, you know, two, three minutes, it passed, and I was completely fine, good old energetic Jason again. Right. Now, are you all empathic on some level? Um, we I have, um, with the team itself, I think we're devised of a, a, a multitude of, you know, mediums. Some will be able to see and hear. Uh, um, some will be able to, you know, feel. Some will, you know, get affected by the spirits. So um, we really have a, a real good kind of mix of, all of them. So where one person may see something, I might not see it, but I can feel it. Um, where I can feel something, they can say, oh, yes, I'm seeing this. So we have really a multitude of mediums across our team. Okay. So besides you, Jason, are Kent or Sarah or Peggy, are you guys mediums at all? Yes. I think uh, that our group, oh, sorry, is no, comprised okay. of a lot, a lot of different kinds of sensitives. I've never seen a group like it. There are so many in our group that are sensitive in different ways. Kent, is de you can go ahead, Kent. Def he's definitely a medium. He's a very good medium. Um, what I, I can do is I can see, hear, and, and talk to the spirits. Um, I generally get a picture in my head of what the house looks like, what's in it, everything else, like a week prior to us visiting that mm -hmm. home. Okay. How is that possible? What Do you have to put yourself in some sort of, uh, like, do you go into, like, a meditative state to kind of connect with the energy, or what? No, it just comes to me. Okay. As I'm driving closer, or getting closer to the investigation, I see more, hear more. Basically, I know, walking in the door, what I'm walking into. Okay. When you walk into somebody's home, are you able to energetically differentiate between what may be a good and a bad spirit? Yes. How do you do that? Is it just a different feeling then, or what? They present themselves in different ways. Good spirits will almost greet you. Bad spirits will present themselves many times as a child, but they don't talk, communicate, or act as a child. And until you call them out on it, you never really see what they truly are. Um, once you see them, they're dark, they're uh, malevolent. I get choked a lot by them. Like physically, you feel like hands wrapping around your throat? Yes. Okay. Do any of you other guys, Jason or Sarah, do you guys have that experience too? I've never uh, um, been I've physically hurt. But, yeah, I get the, the nausea. I'll get the, the dizziness, the nausea, if it's something bad. I do, I feel them. Um, sometimes I see them and sometimes I hear them. But if it's something bad, it's usually the nausea and the dizziness and just the feeling of, like, a general, generally being ill. Okay. Jason, you? Um, I can't say that I've been personally, you know, attacked as uh, Ken has. Um, however, I have... 
I guess you could say almost gone through um, the actual process they went through. Um, for example, touching base on the uh, the first investigation I guess I'd went to, um, you know, I had the chest pains, I had had the shortness of breath. Well, after going through the evidence, we found that there there was a heart attack, you know, that occurred there. On another occasion, I got extremely sick and was almost dry heaving. We also found through and and validated by the um, you know evidence that somebody was extremely sick. I can say there's been times where it's like I might have. I feel as if I'm having pain on my shoulder or whatnot there, or you might feel a scrape or a burning as if there was a cut, um, but I can't say anything as extreme as Ken has actually experienced. Hmm, that's pretty interesting. You know, I mean, I've, I've seen that stuff on, like, the TV shows. I just always wondered how legitimate that was, but apparently it's pretty serious, right? Oh, yeah. It's, yeah, it truly is. Touching base with you there, Ryan, I know that you had mentioned about the meditation um, state. Now, I personally uh, go through an uh, extensive amount of meditation to further the gift, you know, where Kent, he doesn't actually require the meditation. Um, you know, some of us need that meditation to really ground us, to center us, and really open ourselves up so that we can see um, or hear or, you know, actually feel what actually is coming. Right, right. You know, that's a good question for the empaths, too, is, first of all, how did you discover the gift? And then what can people do if they discover it on their own to, to hone it? Well, it, a lot of people discover it in different ways. Um, you're sensitive many times as a child. You'll have real friends that people can't see. And you'll talk with them and they'll converse with you. But then... Your parents will say, oh, there's no such thing. Ghosts don't exist. And, and you know, as a child, I got in trouble for it, you know, for talking about things like that. And so I tampered it down for many, many years and didn't explore my gifts at all until there, I had a massive event in my life that caused me to open my eyes to it, per se. I'll jump back to Sarah here. How do I communicate with a spirit? What's the best way? Honestly, my if you don't um, have any gifts, per se, yeah. I believe everybody kind of does. But a recorder, a digital recorder, that's the best way to communicate. We, as a group, have so many EVPs that we've gotten. And I've been investigating before I was with this group. I've been investigating for a little over 10 years. And within that span, I've gotten so many EVPs. So... You know, even there's a recorder that you can buy to where you could hear it live. And really? so, like, you ask a question, and, at the, you know, you can have the headphones in, and you could listen to a response, you know, real time. Okay. Um, but that, honestly, I think is probably the best way to communicate with them, if you have an intelligent, you know, haunt. Um, sometimes it's, you can go into a place, and it'll be resi residual, and they think that, you know, my house is haunted, but it's just the energy you know, still there from, you know, it could be a really old home and, you know, lots of families live there and it's just, you're picking up residual energy, but we got a lot of, um, you know, intelligent spirits, uh, communicating, you know, Hey, what's your name? And then we'll get, you know, a response. So that's probably the best way I think. Okay. So you just mentioned that, you know, there's an intelligent type of spirit. What other types of spirits have you guys interacted with? This is Peggy. I, uh, I'm not as, sensitive psychically as the other three on this but you'll find that as we add new team members who don't think they've got a mediumship bone in their body next thing you know they're on an investigation and just like Jason described they're surprised at how much they are impacted and they discover that they actually do have abilities so Kent, Nate, and I were recently on an investigation that was demonic, um, and it actually tried to follow the family as they were moving out of the house because they couldn't take it anymore. Both Nate and Kent could see the dark, and I could only see flitting of movement back and forth, but I couldn't see it nearly as well as Kent or Nate. However, what I saw was glimmers of light when we called upon the guardian angels. And so we, through, through the course of that, discovered that, and I've seen it before, and I've seen it since, but that I, it, 
apparently can see the light or the good, uh, the angelic and the protective, whereas I cannot so easily see the dark. Did we lose Peggy there? I don't know. It sounded like we lost her. Oh, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, yeah, I just okay. you just kind of cut out there for a second. It's it's okay. Uh, yeah. So so those are that's a different kind of entity. Um, certainly, full body apparitions. Those are pretty cool. And your brain does <sighs> right away. Sometimes you'll see, and your brain pauses and thinks, "What the heck is that?" But in the meantime, your eyes have already seen somebody that you think is a living human being at least for a moment. Right. What do you say to people when you go into a home and you realize that you're dealing with malevolent demonic spirits? And I mean, like, especially when they don't realize that it might be to that level, like how do you approach that, that sort of a case? The first thing is you have to ask them if they're ready to hear what we know, because some people aren't ready to hear that. And that ties in to the individuals who don't even believe in spirits or anything paranormal. They typically don't have experiences. And so we have to make sure that they're ready and open to hear what we have to tell them. And then is just being, being frank and honest with them uh, and trying to not frighten them. Uh, we've either Kent or I typically close out a case. Uh, Sarah has as well, and and is just delivering it factually, uh, giving evidence, giving links to photos, videos, EVPs, conclusions from the sensitives, and we typically can link everything together scientifically and uh, through uh, psychic as well. Okay. Jason, I'm going to jump back to you. Let's say I do have a spirit in my home that I want to get rid of. What's the best way to go about that? You know, in in my opinion, your best bet is to get in contact with those that can. Um, uh, there, There is a sense of, I, I can't say I've dealt too much with cleansings. Um, that would probably be best directed to Kent. But what I have kind of looked over on it is, I mean, reach out. Um, there, there is a process to it. Um, as I said, Kent can go over those details with you on that. Um, but I, I wouldn't try doing it yourself until you really know what you're dealing with. Okay, Kent, yeah, take me through a cleansing process. Essentially, the first thing you have to know is what you're dealing with. If it's a malevolent spirit or if it's a, a person that does not know they're dead uh, it all depends on the kind of spirit you're dealing with. The general way to, to cleanse is you go into the home. Uh, we are a faith-based organization, which means we use a lot of prayers while we're doing it. Uh, we use, oh, did we lose Kent there? Uh, white sage. Burn the, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Oh, okay, got Okay. Uh, you burn the sage. You get a good smoke going out of it. I use blessed salt and holy water, and we use certain prayers we use. Um, We sprinkle holy water in each corner of the room. We sage the room with the prayers at the same time. Then as we exit each room, we seal that room so that nothing but love, light, happiness, and joy may enter that room. Uh, We make the mark of the cross over above that room, and we continue on. And we push it all in one direction. And we leave a a window open or a door open, anything else, for them to leave out of. After they leave, we salt that door and let it go. Then we will put salt in the four corners of the property. Some demonics, you have to use prayer just to keep them at bay off of you. In those cases, we recommend a member of the clergy to do that kind of cleansing. Uh, that's a little above and beyond our scope. It's it's dangerous. I was going to say, that sounds almost like a, a light version of an exorcism or something. It, it is. It's an exorcism of the home. Right, yeah. That brings up a good question, though. You know, what do you do if you're dealing with people that aren't religious or aren't spiritual? It depends on 
who is at the home. Um, at first, we would just give some uh, more organic resolutions, like throw this salt in the four corners of the room, lay this brick dust across <laughs> the doorstep. But we have really uh, generated towards doing what we do anyway, because from our perspective, if we're doing the cleansing, then we rely on what works for us. And uh, many of us, not all of us, but many of us uh, use prayer. And so if we're the ones doing the cleansing, we're going to use it based on our beliefs to rid the home. We just did that not that long ago. But you do have to instruct the clients that there is a maintenance that they have to continue to do. We give them some prayers anyway. Uh, we find some people just be, have become non-practicing um, as opposed to non-believers. For the non-believers, we just go with the organic things like the salt and the brick dust. Did any of you on the call enter into this as a as a skeptic? I mean, it would seem odd to me that if I'm talking to a bunch of empathic people that you're probably not as skeptical, but... I guess, how have your beliefs about the paranormal changed or been altered since going out on these ghost hunts? I can at least uh, chime in here. Personally, I mean, I, I can say, yes, I am skeptic. I see a lot of these shows, um, and really a lot of it is over-dramatized. Um, one of the driving factors for me is because I wanted proof that it did exist. Yes, there was thoughts in it. I personally never seen one, um, you know, with, you know, at all in my life, and and I can say, I mean, you know, I dabbled in different religions throughout my whole life. But it was really just a matter of I went in wanting proof. Um, I went in carrying that skepticism that nothing's going to happen. And it really what's, what's strange that I found is actually when you go expecting nothing to happen, something happens. I think a lot of times we strive way too much just to, no, this has to work. This, there, there's something here. There's something here. And we really look past that. But when we don't expect something to happen, that's when we usually have the best investigations and the, the best evidence to go over. Right. Sarah, I'm going to jump back to you real quick. Just regarding all the evidence that you guys gather from an investigation, how do you determine if something that you catch on recording or on video or, or in a photo, how do you know for sure that it is something paranormal? Well, it's basically when you could rule out any other factor. So... It's important to not contaminate evidence. So when we're doing EVPs, have all you know all of the electronics turned off, cell phones turned off, or on airplane mode. Um, that's a really important thing to know who's in the room when you're listening to your EVPs or your you know your audio. You get a lot of contamination from the outside. Even that's why a lot of people will say, "Well, why do you guys do it at night?" Well, that's that's kind of why, because you can turn off, you know, you got turn off all the lights. You don't have kids playing outside. You, you know, don't have that contamination. Um, but then when you basically can roll out any other, you know, explanation, that's when you know that it's or you basically know that it's got to be something paranormal. So, like, say me, Jason and Kent are in a room and we hear another woman's voice and it's not ours. We could basically say, okay, we know who was here. We know the questions that were asked. And, you know, that person wasn't there. So that's kind of how we do it. Have you guys dealt with anything that you might have thought was, a, like, was an animal spirit? I have. <laughs> my cat lives in my house. Well, kind of, I guess, is in my house. I've seen him. I had a 30-pound Siamese cat. And he was about the size of a Cocker Spaniel. But I've seen him pass by walking to the kitchen. I've seen him pass by me. So I know he's here, but I see him in shadow form. Okay. We were on an investigation s several months ago where I actually saw the spirit of a young girl and a dog. I, the story I got was they had been hit by a car in front of the house, uh, during the night on recorder. And as well as w audio with our own ears, we could hear a dog barking in the house and there was no dog in the house. Uh, there were no dogs in the area. We were out in the country. You know, that reminds me of a story. Are any of you from the Dayton area or been to the Dayton area? 
I, I live in the Dayton area. Okay, so, so do I, Kent. But have you been to Woodland Cemetery? Yes. You're talking about Johnny? Yeah, Johnny and... Uh, Johnny Morehouse. Yeah, Johnny and the yeah. dog, right? Right, right. Have you guys ever investigated out there? I have not, no. Okay. I'm just curious. As I'm, well. aware of, I'm aware of, of what they say goes on there. A lot of that is, is residual because they don't interact with anyone else. They just seem to be caught up in their own own thing. Could you maybe then differentiate between a residual haunting and then some other types of hauntings? A residual haunting is basically just the release of energy. If something traumatic happens in a home, that energy is imprinted on the, the home itself. And a residual haunt is almost like a videotape. At a certain time, a certain month, a certain day, a certain year, that energy is released and you may see a person walk out of a wall, walk across in front of you and disappear into another wall. They don't acknowledge you're there. They don't speak to you. They don't look at you. They're just, they're, they're a film. You know, it's energy being released and going back into the home. Whereas an intelligent haunt will communicate with you. They will acknowledge your existence there and basically question why you're there. Okay. I think I'll jump back to a, a general question now for anyone that wants to chime in, kind of taking it away from ghosts in general, but have you, have any of you encountered other paranormal phenomena in your life or on an, some sort of investigation, whether it's something like maybe UFOs or cryptids or shadow people, black-eyed kids, anything like that? I have, absolutely. Yeah, um, I've had quite a few stances with uh, some UFO sightings, at least what I believe to be. But you go ahead and continue, Sarah. Uh, I was in contact with MUFON not that long ago. Um, my last year, last August, there was a meteor shower. Um, my son is fascinated with space. So we sat outside, and it was probably midnight, and we uh, set our chairs up. We sat out there for about three hours just staring at the sky. And the meteor shower was not all that great. You'd see maybe four an hour. It wasn't like something crazy. But we sat there and waited anyway. We saw this black object come in. I mean, the sky's black, but this was a sphere that was darker than the blackness of the sky. And we watched it. And he goes, what is that? And I said, I don't know. I have no idea. And him and I watched it for a few minutes. It was going pretty slow. And then we saw a beam come down into the grass about 50 feet away from us. And he goes, oh, my God, Mom, what is that? And he was about, he was 10 at the time. And I said, honestly, I have no idea. And it was, the light was on the ground. It was a circle of light. And we just stared at it. Next thing I know, it's gone. The object's gone. And we're still staring at the sky. Then we see it again. And we see another light. Uh, about another maybe 100 feet away, come down into the neighbor's yard. And I have no idea to this day what that was. And he, he'll tell the story exactly the same way. It was just like a matte black object, had no lights on it, but the light came down from it. Um, I had talked to, I was on, uh, I talked to the people from MUFON. I reported it. And then I had talked to George Norrie about it. He had a guest on the one night, and he said that, that there has been a lot of accounts of that same, a similar sighting like that all over the United States. So, wow. I have no idea. That's pretty crazy. And you said this was August 2015? August, yes. Okay. And Jason, you said that you've had some similar encounters, maybe? Yeah, it happened, actually. I was I can remember it clear as day. I was 14. Uh, I was actually uh, watching X-Files at the time. Uh, no pun intended. But, um, <laughs> right. you know, I had uh, looked outside across, the, you know, at the time I was at my parents, and, I, you know, I looked out across the street, and I saw uh, what seemed to be, you know, a very large, you know, triangle um, rough above my neighbor's house. So, I mean, curiosity got me, so I stepped out and I watched it, and, you know, here was this, you know, I mean, massive, just solid triangle, you know, there wasn't a, a wing separation or anything there, and it had five lights on it, 
Um, and I saw it, and it kind of went back and forth, left to right, for a little bit, you know, and then it stopped as if it was hovering, you know, so I went to get a little bit closer, you know, still now, mind you, still quite a bit of ways from me. Um, I go over to look closer, and then again, I shoot, see it shoot left, go right, and immediately, like, extremely fast, go up in a zigzag motion, and then just vanished. Um... And, I mean, you know, there was no way, you know, a plane could not have moved uh, like that. There there was no details of a plane on it um, whatsoever. Um, and just the, the fluid motion of it, you know, definitely, I'd say it's definitely out of this world. Uh, as well as, um, I dealt with astronomy pretty much my whole life. And I had actually, you know, mapped stars um, when I was younger. And, uh... You know, still do it a little bit to this day, but even today, I can, you know, look out, um, you know, mind, mind you, I'm in Mansfield, but um, I uh, I look out and, you know, look up into the sky, and there's one that I can't, I can't make out what it is, but it's, it's not a, a star. It's got, like, red, blue, and white lights on it, and it looks almost like a, like a, I don't know, more like a sphere um, with a pole through it, and, uh, you we watch it and you concentrate on it and the and the lights move regularly. Um and I've seen it, you know, stay similarly around in the same area but also had moved slightly, but just looking into it you can tell it's not it's not a star. I mean, you know, it's obviously not a satellite because it you know, I wouldn't be able to see the satellites with the distance they are. Um but even to this day, you know, I can still look out every once in a while and still see it there and it's just like as if it's just sitting there and just kinda of observing. Um and then there was one even going, you know, leaving my parents' house. Um it was at night at one point and this point it looked almost like a diamond um in the sky over on Route thirty and and that one particularly had like six lights all right down the center. And, um, again, that just said, you know, kind of hovered really slowly. Um, and then again, just shot tremendously fast, um, in one direction and completely vanished. Wow. That's some, some pretty intense experiences there. And I could see how you all would have an interest in the paranormal just based on your own personal lives. So this is a, a, just one more general question for you guys, whoever wants to jump in and talk about it, but do we have a good idea based on your experiences your research your evidence your investigations that you know where are these spirits coming from where is this paranormal phenomena coming from is it in this reality is it some is it something that's close by is it something that's that's from outer space i mean like what's the best explanation we have for what we're interacting with and where it's coming from i think the best explanation right now is we find they're on another plane not a, another planet, not a, a, another time. It's it's another plane. And there's certain times when the veil between those planes are thinner. It's when people that are not sensitive can see them, experience them. But this is this paranormal research is you start out with a question, you get that question answered, but then you have ten more questions. Because you got that one answer, and it's a constant search of knowledge about where they go. We've seen such an increase in in paranormal um, things since in the last two years. It's it's doubled. Really. Personally, my theory is it's it's due to the all the violent deaths we're experiencing. The um, the overdoses we're experiencing because people are suddenly killed and they wake up, they don't know they're dead. They wander and wonder why people aren't acknowledging them or basically they don't go into the light. They're, they're forever stuck in this, this level where uh, it, they're neither in the light or on earth. They're just stuck in this level. Do we have any indication as to why they might be stuck? Is it is it some sort of attachment to the material world here, or what? Well, there's a lot of reasons that, that we find people are spiritual. One is they're waiting for somebody. Two, they don't know they're dead. 
or three, and, and a big one is, uh, as a child, you're you're taught, you know, if if you commit a sin, if you do this, you're going to hell. God will judge you, and they're afraid to go into that light for fear they're going to be judged, and either sent to hell or go to heaven. And you know, without getting into religion, it's just a matter of they are afraid to go into the light for fear they'll wind up in a worse place. You know, you mentioned, too, that uh, the veil gets thinner at certain points, and I think, you know, we just came off of Halloween recently. I think that's what, this is one of those times of year where the, the veil is very thin, um, and you can see that reflected in other parts of society and culture as well. You know, I don't want to talk about politics and things like that, but the veil just gets thinner around this time of year, it seems. And I know you guys had a busy month last month, and I just kind of wanted to end the conversation on a couple good, memorable cases that you guys have had either recently or just since you've been doing this. If anybody wants to chime in with some good ghost stories, some good hauntings, I'd, I'd love to hear them. Probably one of the best ones I've been on lately uh, was with the little girl and her dog. I could see them very plainly as well as an older couple that lived there. And the funny part about it was they bickered back and forth like an old couple does. Um, and there is no concept of time on the other side of the veil. Uh, this gentleman, he did not want to leave the house. We, uh, before cleansing, we always give them an opportunity to leave on their own. And he said, I just plowed this field last week. I'm planting this field. This is my farm, and I'm not going anywhere. Well, it had not been farm or agriculture in 120 years. So probably to, to delve into it, to, to say, okay, time does not pass on the other side. That's the best example that I can give for that concept. Okay. Sarah, Jason, any memorable cases you guys have been on recently? I could say at least one. One of my memorable cases, I mean, we had just went on um, October 1st, you know, and we finally got the the official, it's in the calendar, the National Ghost Hunting Day. Um, you know, we had worked with Brian Kano, a, a lot of the people from the Haunted Collector, and it was just, it, it was more so, I mean, we, we got some phenomenal evidence, um, and we're still even going through it, but it was nice because we marked as a collective. Um, it wasn't just us, it was us and 70 other teams across the entire U.S., across in australia london um and we were doing it as a collective you know we all had um you know kind of historic marks of you know haunted places and we really got some great things but it was really nice to see um the groups coming together the groups um working hand in hand and uh and really just kind of pushing and striving to, to really make that monumental moment of we now have a national ghost hunting day you know, so, I mean, I think that was a big thing. Just to be part of that, um, I think, was a tremendous opportunity for, for myself as well as, you know, the ghost hunters. And uh, just the collective and, and seeing and working hand in hand, you know, it wasn't just the investigation. You know, we were all working together, you know, months in advance, communicating, talking, you know, doing the sharing prayers. And, I mean, it was really great to see the paranormal community come together as one collective. And, you know, do something monumental. I think that was a, a very, you know, influential, you know, case, at least in our books um, at this point. That was one of the uh, three public ghost hunts that we had just this year. So I definitely agree with Jason. That was an amazing case. Just the energy was so positive. And that's uh, it was all egos aside, you know, because like all the groups were working for one common goal. And we had questions that we all would ask at the same time. It was probably one of the most memorable cases I've ever been on. Okay. Peggy, you know, as the founder, you probably, you've probably been there since day one. I mean, what kind of memories do you have from what you've been doing so far the last couple of years? My favorite ghost story was on the Navy ship that is docked now in Evansville, Indiana. And it's now a museum. But back in its day, it was in Normandy. It was in D-Day. Uh, it was a, a tanker. Its front would flap open, and men or tanks would come out. And so it's the kind of ship that you would see 
in much of the footage from World War II. So from even the pre-investigation walkthrough, we were hearing uh, ghost workers still working on the ship. We would hear a lot of different voices that were just class A EVPs up in the bridge. And my favorite moment of all was sitting in the bunk room, the officer's bunk room, and there were four of us. We heard firecrackers outside. And we didn't know why there would be fireworks at uh, like 1030 at night on a Friday night. So we got on our walkies and the other part of the team couldn't hear it. And we slowly realized that what we were hearing was the residual of what it actually sounded to be there on D-Day, shelled on, and it was phenomenal. I caught it on EVP recorder, and I will never part from those clips. I heard what it felt uh, sounded like to be there. Phenomenal experience. Yeah, that does sound interesting. I love to hear stories about, you know, old ships, old items that have been around the world and come back. And it's just, it's a really interesting story, like you just said. Guys, I'm not going to keep you much longer here. I appreciate your time. Where's the best place for people to learn more about the Ohio Ghost Hunters and get in touch with you guys? Oh, gosh. Um, we got a lot of different things going on right now. I would say that our Facebook our website are the best ways to link up to us and you can contact us on either one of those ohioghosthunters.com and look if you search for Ohio Ghost Hunter page we've got about uh, over 4,500 fans on there and this fall we are just launched a paranormal vlog and we are in the early, early stages of some production on another series called Backyard Paranormal, which tells our own ghost stories. So it's a very exciting time for the team. And we should point out, too, all your services are free, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. All right. So people are interested. They can check out OhioGhostCenters.com, your Facebook page as well. And you guys have a YouTube channel, right? We do, Ohio Ghost Hunters YouTube channel, and on that you'll see some clips from some investigations. Anything from K2 activity to our, uh, we actually captured some shadow movement of shadow figures, and you will see the first three episodes of the Paranormal Vlog on there too. Awesome. Well, Peggy, Kent, Jason, and Sarah, thank you so much for your time. If you're ever in the Dayton area, let me know. I'd love to hook up and go on a ghost hunt with you. That would be we awesome. Love that. Yeah. Awesome. That'd be great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Bye-bye. All right, there you have it. My thanks again to Peggy, Kent, Sarah, and Jason from the Ohio Ghost Hunters. I know it was a little hard to understand there at the end, but you can keep up with them at OhioGhostHunters.com. You can search them on Facebook. You can search them on YouTube. All of those are linked in the show notes. As for us here at O'Culture, you can keep up with the show all across social media. Just search O'Culture Podcast. You'll find us. And if you're a subscriber, be on the lookout for a special feature to this show coming real soon. Again, this is O'Culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, question authority, have a wonderful Thanksgiving, and boycott Black Friday, Cyber Monday, or whatever other bullshit scheme they're trying to get you to fall for this year.
cassette. 